Welcome. Welcome to the Galloway Show. I hope you can hear me. That was a rather rude beginning. I hope it went smoothly for you. Thanks for joining us. This is, as you've probably already discovered, no budget television. Just me and my missus and my pal down in Manchester. Uh, one camera in the back room. And there's not much good news on the show this evening. So let me start with two rare rays of sunshine. The first one is that this show will now last for an hour and a half rather than an hour. So as to allow more interaction, more questions, more answers. So it's a 90 minute show tonight and hopefully here after. And that's the first piece of good news. The second, even better piece of good news is that we're going to relaunch the midweek mother of all talk shows on Wednesday, the 12th of October. So put that date in your diary. It'll probably have to be shorter than the Sunday mother of all talk shows. We don't have a sponsor. We'll be relying on the audience to support it through their donations, but it's definitely on. The studio is booked and the staff have been recruited or re-recruited, I should say. We brought back the people that we had to let go when we had to give up the mother of all talk shows on Wednesdays. The Sunday show continues exactly the same, three hours every Sunday at 7 p.m. And it will continue uh, over the summer, though, again, maybe on a truncated uh, basis. But we do have a sponsor for the Sunday show. There's no need for audience support for that. The audience support is all for getting the midweek moats and the podcast back on the market. So you know how to give. Just go to the Super Chat function here on YouTube, ask a question, make a donation uh, in any denomination of any size, even one pound, one dollar will be very gratefully received. But the rest of the news is all bad, but important. And there's no point in hiding from important bad news. I'm going to start with one of the worst pictures I've seen in a very long time, almost biblical it looked. And I refer, of course, to the massacre in Melilla on the Moroccan-Spanish border of at least 37 African immigrants or refugees. Who knows? We'll never know. But as many as 300, according to the survivors of what was a shocking crime, uh, of uh, Nazi proportions, the kind of things that Nazis used to do in occupied towns and villages. It was a savage genocidal attack on desperate, poor, even hungry people trying to get through the fence that separates the Moroccan North African state and the state of Spain a pillar of the European Union, a pillar of NATO, and you may very well be scratching your head at the geography of that. How can there be a fence between Africa and Spain? How can there be when the entire Mediterranean Sea lies between them? The answer, dear viewers, is perplexing indeed. Spain has the last official European colonies in Africa. They are in North Africa, in Morocco. They have no legitimate legal or moral basis. But guess what? You, if you're in a NATO country, are committed to the defense of the Melilla enclave, a Spanish colony in Africa. You never saw that one coming, did you? When you hear talk of NATO as a defensive alliance, you didn't know that it included the defense of a Spanish colony illegally enclaved inside 
Morocco, but of course, now that the millions of people in Africa, through the depredation of drought, of famine, of hunger, of poverty, of disease, and oftentimes of war, civil war, strife of all kinds in Libya and in uh, parts, Ethiopia, many parts of Africa riven by civil war. Millions are on the march and they're headed for Europe. And when they reach the Spanish border, for that is what it is, they try and climb on this occasion, try and burst open uh, the fence that separates the European Union from the hungry masses of the African continent. It is a grim and dismal tale, but it has much political symbolism and significance. If I tell you that Spain has perfectly peacefully been ready to and has received 110,000 white, blonde, blue-eyed immigrants from Ukraine, they, many of them, will claim political asylum like some, maybe all, of these Africans trying to get into the same country of Spain would have done. 110,000 without let or hindrance, without a wall, without a fence, and without very much fuss at all, have been allowed to resettle in Spain. And yet, when a few thousand hungry people from Africa tried to enter Spain through the fence at Melilla, they had to be massacred. Of course, on the face of it, they were massacred by Moroccan border guards. But they were agents of Spain. Let's make no mistake about that. These people were massacred in the name of Spain. That's why all over Spain today there are mass demonstrations, die-ins, people lying down in big squares all over Spain because the sheer horror of what happened is widely known in Spain, but you're probably hearing about it for the first time if you are in Britain or Canada or the United States or Australia or anywhere else in the Anglosphere because the blood of black Africans is worth almost nothing. It is worth far less than the blood of almost everybody else on the planet. These Moroccan border guards are bribed by Spain to keep out any immigrant from crossing over that fence. They are bribed individually and their country of Morocco is bribed massively by Spain. So when these border guards beat either 37 or 300 or something in between to death, that's how they killed them. They beat them to death. When they did so, they were acting as agents for a country at the heart of the European Union and a country at the heart of NATO. And Spain has now raised with NATO its Article 7 obligations to defend Spanish territory, including an illegal European colony in Africa. And I believe that the juxtaposition of the way in which Ukrainian refugees have been treated and the way in which African, Afghan, Iraqi and other refugees or economic migrants, I'll turn to that question in a minute. The difference so brazen, so, so absolutely ugly grotesque, the difference between the two is only explicable by racism. That's the only possible explanation. After all, if it was about economic uh, usefulness, the Africans would be better. 
They'll work harder for less. The Ukrainians are coming with their whole families and come from a European country and will be looking for more wages, better accommodation than the Africans would be happy to settle for. So it cannot be that we can make more use of the economic industry of the Ukrainian refugee. It must be because the Ukrainians look like us and the Africans do not. Now, regular viewers will know I'm not in favor of mass migration. The answer to the swirling mass of humanity in the poorest countries, trying to escape them as economic refugees, just like my grandparents and great-grandparents did, escaping Ireland for Britain a century and more ago. The answer is not to drop all immigration controls. The answer is not to herald the free movement of the poorest people in the world from their own countries to ours. That will only make our countries poorer and make their countries even poorer because the young and the entrepreneurial and the uh, people with the greatest mobility will be leaving their country rather than building their own country. So this is not a plea for open borders. But what you can't do is murder people who turn up trying to claim asylum. After all, claiming asylum is their legal right enshrined in international law, enshrined in the Geneva Convention, enshrined in the European Convention of Human Rights. Do these things not matter if you're black? Do these uh, conventions not count if you're an African? If they do count, and who would have the nerve to go in front of a cam camera and say, no, they don't count because they're black. They don't count because they're African. Then if they do count, then the breach of international law and the act of mass murder constitutes a crime of the gravest proportions. And the entire United Nations and European Union institutions should now be mobilizing for the punishment, for the identification of the deceased. And you know the reason why there's a difference in number between 37 and 300? Because the Moroccans dragged the bodies away and buried them in shallow graves without identifying them without identifying a cause of death. But you can see pictures of very significant numbers of people clubbed to death trying to get into the European Union. Now, this is not a dinghy accidentally sinking in the English Channel. This is murder. This is murder most foul. This is murder most foul on a massive scale. What are we going to do about it? Are the news media even going to report it? Are the politicians going to cry out about it? Will anyone put twibbons on their avatars? Will we see flags for the deceased? Will we see fundraising for their bereaved families back at home? No, you all know the answer to the questions I am posing. The world is ill-divided. Fortress Europe is a fortress against the rest of the world. Not a fortress behind the walls of which we can build the great society for there ain't no great societies being built inside Fortress Europe now. Now I fought to leave the European Union. And I'm very glad that I did, and even more glad that we prevailed. But don't imagine for a minute that Britain is any better uh, than the other European colonial countries. Somehow this whole episode encapsulates for me the modern, because it is modern, recent, 
colonial history of France, of Spain, of Belgium, of the Netherlands, of Germany, of Britain, the colonies that we established didn't just kill and loot. It even looted the people themselves, carrying them in the holds of ships in chains as slaves, beasts of burden to build the economies of our empire in the Caribbean and later in North America. Whole cities in Britain, Bristol, Liverpool, Glasgow, grew fat and rich, or the wealthy in those cities did at least, on the proceeds of that slave trade. That wasn't ancient history. I saw a picture today of a handprint from 30,000 years ago. So what happened in the 18th and 19th centuries is not ancient history. And we did it. And yet, in 2022, we can remain silent and mute and inactive in the face of the atrocity that happened this week on the borders of Spain in Africa. Good luck, NATO, if you seek to persuade the European public opinion, North American public opinion, that we have to send NATO forces to defend Spanish colonies illegally occupying Moroccan territory in Africa. Good luck with that. And with that, I now turn to NATO, who are meeting in conclave right now. Some very important decisions are being made at that NATO summit. First of all, they have designated Russia as the greatest threat ever to the countries and the way of life of the countries that are members of NATO. Turkey having now dropped its opposition to Sweden and Finland joining the NATO alliance, producing yet another casus belli between Russia and NATO, is about to get larger still. And if they have designated Russia as the most dangerous of their threats, the most dangerous of their enemies, the question obviously arises, what are they going to do about it? And that's why I'm running this poll on the show tonight. For it's clearly not possible for the existing size of the European Union armies to fight Russia hypersonically, intercontinentally, ballistic, nuclear-armed Russia, we have to tool up. We'll have to get bigger armed forces. I don't know the exact size of the armed forces, on the mainland of Europe, but I do know exactly the size of the British armed forces. I do know that the entire armed forces of the United Kingdom could fit into Wembley Stadium with a, an embarrassing number of empty seats visible uh, to the cameras. That's why we settle for Villa Park, where our armed forces can fit snugly and perfectly. That's how small our armed forces are. And in figures released today, our defense budget is about to be cut. We're threatening Russia. And on the same day we learn, we are cutting our defense budget. In real terms, over the next five years, we will spend more than three billion pounds less on defense than we are spending today. So it won't be our armed forces that are going to fight Russia, will it? 
Boris. Are you actually the new Mussolini? Mussolini used to go around the world threatening people with Germany's army. That's what Boris Johnson was doing today at the NATO summit. He was threatening Russia with America's army because our army, understrength, underpowered, underpaid, poorly clad, poorly equipped, poorly paid, poorly housed, is not a match for dad's army, never mind the Russian army. And everyone in the British military or who takes a close interest in it, like me, knows that we couldn't fight Russia's dad's army. We couldn't fight Russia's old lady's army. So who's going to fight Russia, Boris? And that's why I'm saying, if Russia is such a big threat, why are we cutting our defense budget? If Russia is such a big threat to us, why have we got such a small army? Isn't it time that we reintroduced conscription? Isn't it time that we began to draft people into the army to fight for NATO against Russia? Surely. But of course, that will not happen because nobody is prepared to be drafted to fight for Boris Johnson and NATO. Nobody would agree to be conscripted. The government would fall if it suggested any such thing. There would be mass opposition, millions of people on the streets against it. Which then begs another question. If the British people don't want to fight Russia, if the British people don't want to join the NATO army to confront Russia, on what basis are we doing it? Are we doing it despite the British people? Are we doing it in secret in the hope that no one will notice? Or are we hoping that the United States, young men and women, will do the dying for us? These are very important questions. And it's about time we stepped up to the plate and asked them. You can't go around threatening Russia, you know, because if you keep poking a bear with a stick through the bars, eventually it's going to grab your arm and it's going to bite your head off. Which brings me to Kaliningrad and the Lithuanian plan to turn the tide of the war in Ukraine by actually blockading, laying siege to a part of Russia which is separated from its motherland but the connection between the two guaranteed by treaty with the European Union. The treaty makes clear that there will be no let or hindrance in the movement of people or things between Russia proper and its territory in Kaliningrad. The treaty makes clear that no one will ever seek to interdict the supply of food and oil and gas, and medicines, and essential personnel to the territory of Kaliningrad. But Lithuania, claiming that it was acting for the European Union, announced a blockade of a part of Russia. Now, have you seen Lithuania? Look on the map. Do you even know where Lithuania is? Do you want to die for Lithuania? Do you want World War III to break out over Lithuania? I don't know anyone who does. Do you? But that's what's going to happen unless this blockade is immediately 
lifted. Lithuania is a flea threatening a giant grizzly bear with not just claws but nuclear weapons by the thousand. Russia will wipe independent Lithuania off the map in an hour, maybe half an hour. This is the madness into which we have been led. We are a gnat, a flea, is threatening Russia and thereby threatening the rest of us with catastrophic nuclear war over Kaliningrad. So European Union officials today were briefing that it'll all soon be over. The boycott, the blockade, the siege will be lifted and the terms of the treaty that Russia has with the European Union will be observed. I hope so, because I don't want to see Lithuania suffer. One third of the population of Lithuania are Russian in any case. So no Russian wants to see Lithuania harm. So common sense must be forced to prevail on Vilnius. They have to back down. And quick, because as Medvedev, the former Russian president, former Russian prime minister, and still leading figure in the Russian government, as Medvedev put it, the Russian response will be swift and terrible. We don't want any more swift and terrible. So we need to make clear that we will not die for Lithuania, will not die for NATO, will not die for Boris Johnson. In fact, we demand an end to this apparently endless escalation of weapons supplies and financial shoveling of billions down the throat of the now bloated comedian Zelensky. I don't know what's happening to that money. I do know he has a very nice oceanfront residence in Miami. I do know that the Pandora Papers revealed that he was exceedingly rich for a comedian. I don't care about him. I do care about the people of the Ukraine. And I know that they are not benefiting from this 75 billion dollars that has been shoveled since February down the throat of the hungry regime in Kiev. I do know that Boris Johnson ponied up yesterday another 1.75 million, 175 million pounds to the regime in Kiev. Do you know that he's even pledged almost two million pounds to rebuild the railways in Ukraine when our own railways are in a state of absolute crisis such that they're trying to sack the guards off the trains. And we now have a national rail dispute which is not yet resolved and which is showing signs of turning into an uprising rather than a mere industrial dispute. All kinds of workers, health workers, education workers, British Airways workers, workers in local authority are all now emboldened to say, hey, if you give me a pay offer, which is actually a pay cut with inflation at 10%, then you're asking me to be much poorer this year than I was last year. And I'm not going to stand up for that. Not at a time when profits are booming, 
when billionaires are becoming trillionaires and multi-millionaires are becoming billionaires? Do you know how much profit the train operators shifted to their shareholders over the last 12 months? Do you know who those shareholders are? Half of them are private individuals, but half of them are state-owned railway companies in France and Spain. So the British traveler and the British rail worker is subsidizing the railways in France and in Spain. What madness is this? Many people are now beginning to ask. Finally, I want to turn to the British domestic a political scene. It is abundantly clear, to me in any case, I think from the polls also, that nobody much in Britain fancies either the Prime Minister or the leader of the opposition and don't even know the name of the leader of the third party. Never in all my time in politics, which began in 1967, when I joined the Labour Party at the age of 13, never in all that time has the political class seemed so small. I'm not doing a Greta Garbo on you. When she was asked, you used to be big in pictures, she said, I'm still big, it's the pictures that got small. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not talking about my own absence from the political scene. I have no more interest in that. But I've lived through a period in which on both sides of the House of Commons, by the score, even in some periods, by the hundreds, figures of substance, men and women of independent mind, of great competence and experience, people who fought in wars, people who built great multinational companies, people who led big industrial trade unions, people who dug coal, people who drove trucks, people who ran shops, Parliament was recognizably a microcosm of at least the most achieving, if not the best, morally, I'm not going to claim that, of the British people. But look at it today. Look at the dwarves that are dragged out on television to either propose government policies or oppose those government policies. People we've never heard of. People we're left scratching our heads about. Did she really say that? Did Liz Truss, did you ever imagine that Liz Truss would fill the office of Lord Palmerston, of Ernest Bevin, of Anthony Crossland, of Roy Jenkins? Did, of James Callaghan, did you see that coming? Did you see it coming? That somebody called Wes Streeting, a hairdresser from Ilford, would be the heir, forgive the pun, the heir apparent for the leadership of the Labour Party. Did you see that coming? His main rival being the ginger one, Angela Raynard. Did you see it coming that the party of Barbara Castle and Claire Short would have as its leading woman the ginger growler? Really? Did you? Did you imagine that the disreputable wretch 
that is Boris Johnson, would fill the great office of Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Did you imagine that we have come to this? But come to it, I'm afraid we have. We really have come to it. That our country is all at sea, tossing like a cork on the waves, with no captain, no direction home. It's the worst trip we've ever been on. This sloopy John Boris, it is a nightmare. It is a national nightmare. Petrol or diesel is now 10 pounds a gallon. I thought it would take to the winter. Diesel is already in June, 10 pounds a gallon. For American viewers, that's nearly $15 a gallon. You're paying six. We're paying nearly $15 a barrel. A gallon and it is rising apparently inexorably. The government cannot cut the full fuel duty, but it's handing out billions to the fool. Zelensky, we can't repair our own railways, we're repairing Ukraine's railways instead. Nicola Sturgeon is on the verge of declaring UDI, which if it were to succeed would lose half, half of our national territory. We're drifting into war when we've got no soldiers. This is a national nightmare. And if we don't wake up from it soon and do something, about it soon. Our island story, our thousand years of history could be coming uh, to an end. Gatry, can I take uh, uh, questions if people have got them? Sean Bebbington gives 10 pounds to the fighting fund. Thanks, Sean. Please give a shout out to the Birmingham members of the Workers' Party of Britain. Well, Sean, I, of course, am delighted to do that as the leader of the Workers' Party of Britain. And I send my salute to all of my comrades this evening and commend them on all the work that they are doing. Let's see if there are any more. Edward Smith, will we still have electricity in October? Maybe not. You may well not be able to afford it in any case, uh, but we are now discovering the scale of the shortfall. If you look at Germany first, 40% of the norm of the contracted amount is what Russia supplied in the month of June. Just 40%. So, not only are we sanctioning Russia, Russia is now sanctioning us. They don't care. They're selling all their gas and their oil elsewhere. But we don't have any other suppliers. As Macron was caught on camera telling Biden just the other day at the so-called G7, one or two big economies and a few minnows calling themselves the G7 like Juan Guaido calling himself the, the uh, president of Venezuela or like me claiming to be the middleweight champion uh, of Great Britain. It's a joke, the G7. But Macron was there and he was caught talking to Biden and he said, and I quote, I have a photographic memory for these things. I've spoken to MBZ. Uh, that's the uh, acting, maybe now leader of the United Arab Emirates, and asked him to pump more. And he said, 
he's at the maximum. He cannot produce any more oil. And the Saudis, he said, can only squeeze another 150,000 barrels a day, which is nothing in the great scheme of things. So we don't have any options. And therefore, shortage. Going without. Rationing. Massive price increases. Massive shortages. Never mind by October. At this rate, long before October, our inflation rate touched 10%. Spain is over 10%. We haven't yet got the figures for this quarter from France and Germany. At least I haven't read them, but they will not be radically different. 10% inflation fueling Massive price increases and wage demands, industrial disputes and all the rest of it. What a mess we are in. And the Russians are laughing all the way to the bank. Let's see what else we've got. Uh, Eric Suarez gives $5. Thanks, Eric. Europe is moving to coal. Soon they'll use horses to... <laughs> Well, I'm a big fan of coal. I fought hard every day for a year to save the coal industry in Britain. I believe that Britain, an island built on coal, we have a thousand years of coal under our feet. I drove today past the Paul Kemet shopping center on the M8 and I got to thinking not that long ago Paul Kemet was a deep mine producing massive massive tons of coal I got to thinking about the Scottish coal field about I was in Newcastle on Monday night about the Durham cold field, about the Northumbrian mines. I got to thinking about the Lancashire coal field, the Yorkshire coal field, the Nottinghamshire coal field, the Kent coal field, the South Wales coal field. A thousand years of coal wrecked in an act of industrial vandalism in a worship of accountancy over economics, wrecked by the goth, the vandal, Margaret Thatcher, 40 years ago. But you're right. I think it was Eric. Germany's reopening its coal power plant. Whatever happened to COP26? Whatever happened to the hug a polar bear, hug a husky declaration. What about all those tears they were shedding in Glasgow at the COP26 jamboree? Cutting emissions, stopping oil, stopping gas, stopping coal. What happened to all of that guff? Well, extraordinarily, we're still footing the bill for going green without actually going green. You might call it the worst of both worlds, a double whammy. That's what we are facing. So I believe in coal myself. I believed even in the 1980s, we had the clean coal technology, the carbon capture technology that could have made coal viable for a very long time and not damage the environment. But whether you agree with me on that or not, needs must. If there ain't no gas and there ain't no oil, what are you going to burn? Let's see if anyone else 
Uh, Abdullah Abdi says, I can't believe I just learned about Mr. Galloway very recently. Thank you, YouTube algorithm. Well, Abdullah, it's not often that the algorithms do me any favors. I'm suing Twitter at the moment. Um, I hope I don't have to sue TikTok as well. That would be uh, lamentable. But I am suing uh, Twitter at the moment in the Dublin courts. And I'm doing a lot of research into what the meaning practically has been of the slapping of the false label Russian state-affiliated media on my personal Twitter account. And it's eye-opening indeed. It may be that my reach on Twitter is as much as 90% reduced by algorithmic pressure, censorship, shadow banning, and all the rest. I'm hoping that Elon Musk, whose birthday was yesterday, when he gets his feet under the desk, will do something about this shameless witch hunting and censorship in which the company he is in the process of buying has now become notorious for. He might let us down, of course, but it's worth a try. I'd rather Elon Musk than the princes of Saudi Arabia who currently own Twitter. Didn't know that, did you? Let's see if there's any others. Uh, Jonathan Wood, £4.49. Thanks, Jonathan. Brilliant news about the Wednesday moats and the podcast returning soon. Returning August, uh, sorry, October the 12th. October the 12th. Put it in your diary. Ho see GG, if Scotland go independent, will you stay in the UK? Well, I don't believe that uh, there's any prospect of that. Scottish people are far too sensible for that. We rejected it before when the argument for it was stronger than it is now that, uh, that uh, we've left the European Union. You couldn't possibly have an independent Scotland in the European Union while England and Wales were out of the European Union because you would then have exactly the same brouhaha that you have now in the north of Ireland. But in this case, you would have a very large wall with lots of German shepherd dogs and very, very long delays for the 60% of Scottish exports that go not to the European Union, but to the rest of the UK. It would be an economic catastrophe. And I don't believe the Scots who are famously, well, how shall I put it, careful with money, will ever go into that good night. Uh, but of course, uh, the British government has a duty to, uh, to step up its uh, defense of and its support for and its, uh, its uh, positive case for uh, the British people staying together. And I don't have any confidence that the Boris Johnson government and the conservative grandees that run things for him in, uh, in the Scottish government in the UK government in Scotland, I don't believe that they are up to the job. I've seen no evidence that they are up to the job. As a matter of fact, there is brazen, blatantly illegal, unlawful, ultra vires spending going on every single day in the Scottish Parliament in Holyrood. Things that are ultra vires they are beyond the powers of the Scottish Parliament and government, so-called, to expend. But they expend it anyway. Uh, they, they pay civil servants to a plan for a referendum to break up the United Kingdom when the Scottish Parliament has no such power to hold such a referendum. They are expending millions of pounds on a pretendy referendum in October next year, they say, 
although I think the court will strike it down long before then. Uh, millions on a pretendy referendum that will be uh, advisory, non-binding on anybody. But of course, people like me will actively boycott this pretendy referendum. By actively, I mean we'll be going around trying to persuade our fellow Scots to have nothing whatsoever to do with it. And the government surely will make clear that no civil servant may participate in any way. And local authorities will have to refuse the use of schools and staff and facilities and town halls and counting agents and clerks. And none of that will be available. It is a farce. But they have them. But you know that the so-called Scottish government has embassies around the world in parallel to the British embassies, when foreign affairs is a reserved matter to Westminster. They have no power to make such expenditure, but they make it anyway. Now, I know why the SNP do that, but I really don't know why the British government allow them to do it. That is one of the great mysteries of my life, I must tell you. We spend billions defending our country from foreign enemies while we have an enemy within separatism that if it were to succeed would take away half of our national territory it makes no sense that a british government sits just gazing at all of that Let's see what else is cooking. What I don't understand, George, is when Russia was at its weakest, militarily and financially, from 92 to 97, it was no threat to anyone. Why did NATO then expand, not expand, I think uh, Michael Kelleher means, uh, expand into uh, Eastern Europe? Well, they probably think they didn't have to. Uh, but now they think they have to because Russia was a basket case then and is very, very far from being a basket case now. That's really why they hate Putin, you know. It's not because he's bare-chested on, uh, you know, on the back of a horse with no saddle. I think that looks pretty cool, actually. That's not why they hate him. They don't hate him because of the Crimea Oh, let me digress. How funny was it that Boris Johnson said today that if Boris, if, uh, if uh, Vladimir Putin had been a woman, very difficult thing to imagine, he would never have done what he did in the Ukraine. This, he said, was as close as you can get to a perfect example of toxic masculinity. He'd obviously never heard of Catherine the Great, who conquered the Ukraine, who conquered Crimea, before, <clears throat> unfortunately, encountering an accident with a horse. And I'm not going to go any further down that murky route. The harpsichord of Mozart says, Ghislaine Maxwell, 20 years in jail. R. Kelly, same offence, 30 years in jail. Well, uh, I'm not sure that they are the uh, same offence. Both are uh, heavy sentences. I don't think that we should underestimate uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, age 60, getting 20 years in prison with no possibility of parole and five years of supervised release if she lives until she's 80 behind bars. Uh, so supervised release until she's 85, that, that's not a light sentence. Uh, so I'm not going to pretend I'm outraged at it. What I am outraged about is if Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein were trafficking children, for sexual purposes, who were they trafficking them to?
to? Who for? Who was the end user of these tragic children and young girls that were trafficked by this pair of monsters, beasts, Epstein and Maxwell? Was it only Epstein and Maxwell that were using them? We know that that's not true. We know that the FBI seized pictures and videos in the townhouse in Manhattan given to Epstein for a single dollar from Victoria's Secret's owner Leslie Wexner. We know that these pictures and videos exist of adult men raping children. When are these men going to be charged? How is it that courtesy of the New York Times, we can know the name of every donor and what they gave to the Canadian truckers' convoy, but we can't know a single name of the beasts that these children were being trafficked for. I'll be dealing with this subject again on Sunday on the Mother of All talk shows. Let's see. What else we've got? Uh, Tamim Q sends S-E-K. Is that Swedish? Uh, 50. Thank you, Tamim. Uh, whatever it is. Even if it's 50 pence, I thank you. Any whispers of Europe aligning itself with Asia pre or post uh, total collapse? Well, I gave an interview which is published today in the Global Times, the small circulation Chinese newspaper. It only sells I think 11 million copies a day. Uh, I gave an interview uh, to the Global Times, and uh, as I say, it was published today, and I made the point that, for Britain at least, Brexit gave us the opportunity uh, to be an ocean-going liner setting forth across the rolling ocean uh, to the BRICS, to the Chinese, Everywhere in the world, we could have been a truly independent power, motivated by a desire for fairness and justice and trade. Win-win, trade, fair trade. But we didn't make that choice. We made the choice to be the tail of the American dog. But with one bound, we were free from the European Union and then promptly shacked up with Joe Biden. Seriously? Let's see what else we've got. Uh, Mr. UK, Africa is not our responsibility or problem. Well, that's a moot point. And I see you've got Mr. Churchill as your avatar. It's a moot point. I seem to recall that we owned and looted Africa for uh, well over a century, a hundred years. I seem to recall that we scrambled with other European powers uh, for Africa over a period of 150 years. I seem to recall our uh, significant role. We weren't the first. We weren't the only but our significant role in the international slave trade from which our country grew fantastically wealthy. And those slaves were African. So to claim now that Africa is not our responsibility is rather mean-spirited of you. But here's where you'll be delighted. Africa doesn't actually need or want anything to do with us. Just stay away, is all the Africans are asking. Because you see, Africa is not poor, but rich. And Africa doesn't need Britain's help because it's got China's help. And China is building bridges and roads and airports and, and ports and terminals. 
it is concretely investing in Africa rather than taking out of Africa. But you should have thought of that, Mr. Churchill Manke, when you blew the bloody doors off in Libya. Because I'm guessing you probably supported that war. I'm guessing that you thought it was great when Gaddafi was sodomized with a bayonet. I'm guessing you chuckled along with Hillary Clinton. We came, we saw, he died. I'm guessing that you thought it was a jolly wheeze to blow the bloody doors off. But of course, when the actual state of Libya was destroyed by us. How's that for staying out of Africa? Uh, that was the gate open to the Mediterranean. And across the Mediterranean is Europe. And across the channel from Europe is Britain. So I don't know, Mr. Churchill, Manke, whether you are a fool, an idiot, or a knave, or worse, but either way, you really have got it terribly, terribly wrong. I urge you to return to your books. Let's see what else we've got. John B., what do you think will happen with Sri Lanka? Will the IMF bail them out, or will their economic situation worsen? I'm, I'm not an expert at all, uh, John in Sri Lanka, but we did have an expert on uh, the mother of all talk shows. I think not last Sunday, but the Sunday before. Uh, so I urge you to uh, listen to his prognosis. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look good for Sri Lanka at all. Paul McCord says, let all enclaves have a referendum to decide whether they wish to remain ruled by the present administration or to return to being ruled by the surrounding country. But nobody lives in the enclave, Paul. Only Spanish officials and servants live in the enclave. It's not a colony for the purposes of, uh, of having a little bit of Spain in Africa. It is a military, political colony. Because they can't have Gibraltar, they have got Melilla. And Melilla is uh, of great strategic military value for Spain. It used to have the Spanish Sahara which it was forced to vacate uh, some decades ago after the so-called Green March launched by Morocco, which took it back. The Sahara is now contested between uh, the Moroccan monarchy and the Polisario uh, guerrilla group backed by Algeria. But at least it's no longer pretending to be Spanish unlike the Melilla enclave. Let's uh, go to Morpheus X. Same thing happened in the Korean protest against NATO expansion and Korea joining the NATO summit. I don't see any media reported it apart from CCTV China. Uh, when you say the same thing happened, what, what happened? I presume you don't mean that hundreds of people were killed because I certainly missed that if that happened. Let's see uh, what happens. Please keep giving uh, on the uh, Super Chat, will you? Tanya Keen says, the UK train strikes. Now legal aid joined. Tomorrow, Royal Mail. And uh, media poll shocked citizens agree. Yeah, you're right, Tanya. Uh, the majority of British people back the strikes because they know that a sub-inflation level pay increase is not an increase at all. 
It's a cut. Why should anyone who did nothing wrong, especially people that worked right throughout the pandemic and we were clapping them, and now we want them to take a pay cut? No thanks. Absolutely no thanks. Giles McComish gives £10. Many thanks, uh, Giles, as always. Poppy says, why would the young men join the army in the UK when there's hundreds of army vets on the streets? And look what they did to Dennis Hutchinson. I don't know who Dennis Hutchinson is. Poppy, please forgive me. But you're absolutely correct. Uh, army vets are disproportionately to be found in the prisons on the pavements, living rough, in the mental health crises, clinics, and hospitals. Uh, they are far more likely uh, to uh, commit suicide. Uh, they are far more likely uh, to be uh, living extremely unhappy lives for lots of complex reasons. And it's not even as if the pay is good or the pension is good. It used to be that you got an army pension and you easily picked up work on top of that army pension, but that work is not available now. And oftentimes, army personnel don't have the necessary skills. The necessary skills today are pretty high tech. You don't come out of the army necessarily uh, equipped with high tech uh, skills, certainly not if you're from the poor bloody infantry. Uh, Angela Omera says, does anyone believe the flight cancellations are from COVID hangover? The talk is airlines are bust. Half the world's airplanes are in Russia. It's true. We took their yachts. The West have messed up bad. Angela, you have got it in one very well said. Uh, Constance Arons says, the political class today is overflowing with mediocrities. It surely is. Dangerous mediocrities. No political vision. Short-sighted clowns. Brilliant. I wish I'd said that. I couldn't say it any better than you said it. Thanks uh, for doing that. Uh, Paul Jackson says, Liz Truss. <laughs> Liz Truss is a surgical appliance worn to support a hernia. Typically a padded belt. Whatever happened to those trusses? You used to see them sometimes lying in the street. I haven't seen a truss in decades. But when I look at Liz Truss, I always think of it. She's enough to give anybody a hernia. Let's see. Uh, Chin gives NOK 500. Is that Norwegian krona 500? If so, it is one hell of a generous donation. I appreciate that very much, whatever it is, but especially if it's 500 big ones. Uh, the serial effect generator is a magnetic electron attractor that generates power, is a suppressed technology. That's Searle, S-E-A-R-L, Searle effect generator is a magnetic electron attractor that generates power. It is a suppressed technology. Well, I'll definitely look into it, uh, as you've mentioned. Um, maybe give the uh, moats a call on Sunday, if you will, uh, on that. I'll make sure your call uh, gets through. Any other questions? Eric Suarez gives $2. KO, viva George. Thank you, brother. God bless you, and thanks. For that two dollars, Alexandra Markovich gives RSD two hundred and fifty. I don't know what RSD is, but I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Alexandra, for it. Maybe somebody can tell me. George, what do you think is the actual general opinion regarding Scotland's independence? Also, I think the West is gearing towards war. Uh, sixty, be sixty forty. I would think. 60 for remaining in Britain, 40 for separatism, which is uh, still uh, way too high. Um, for a long time, the separatist cause was supported by maybe a quarter uh, of the British, the Scottish people, but 
40% is way too high, but it's way, way, way too few in order to break up a country. Yeah. Serbia. Serbia, thank you so much. God bless Serbia. And Red Star Belgrade. Forgive me if you're a partisan supporter. But we are a Red Star family. Uh, Alexander Chan says, congratulations on 200,000 subscribers. Thank you, Alexander. It was a long time coming. I never got my silver plaque for getting 100,000 subscribers. I figure maybe that I've got double that. They'll finally give me the silver plaque. I don't need a silver plaque. I just need them not to interfere with me and let me build a bigger and bigger audience here on YouTube. That's in their interest. It's in mine, and I think it is in yours also. Uh, so, so far, YouTube has been the best social media platform with me. I'm having trouble with all of the rest. With Twitter, obviously, uh, most. But with Facebook, at least 75% of my reach on Facebook is now being suppressed. And TikTok has now taken down and given me two public warnings, two of my monologues from the mother of all talk shows that were broadcast live and are still on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. But they've been struck down off TikTok. And a warning given to me that one more, and you're out. I'm thinking of taking it up with that President Xi Jinping. Uh, let's uh, see, Teresa Kelly, $10. Thanks, Teresa. You are such a darling and such a support. I really appreciate it. Uh, Teresa says, uh, great show. Thanks, Teresa, as always. Giles gives two pounds. Great show in Newcastle. Oh, I'm glad you were there, uh, Giles. Um, uh, this was the Killing Kelly uh, performance in the Copthorne Hotel last Monday night, uh, two nights ago, in Newcastle. It was a fantastic audience of interesting and interested people. Uh, we, we sold, I think, around 90 tickets in the end, which made it uh, economically viable. 90 is about the, if you like, the, uh, the bar. Uh, but we, we sold books and DVDs, and I signed them, and it was a great atmosphere. Everybody enjoyed it, and I'm glad you did, Giles. And thanks for the, for the two pounds, my friend. Uh, Zook, Zookski gives five pounds. Thanks, Zook. What to say about the BRICS sanctioning the West? Well, I don't think sanctions are a good idea. I think that, you know, it's far better if we don't have recourse to economic warfare against each other. Let's trade with each other, invest in each other, look out for each other. If the West doesn't want to do that, fair enough, stay away. We'll do it amongst ourselves in the BRICS. Argentina and Iran have just applied to join, so that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Argentina, and Iran. That's one hell of a chunk of the population of the world. As a matter of fact, it's 40% of the population of the world. And the sun is rising, economically speaking, on the people of the East. I wish. I, I wish we were in the BRICS. I'd rather be in the BRICS than in NATO, wouldn't you? By the way, how are people voting on whether or not we should uh, have conscription? Any uh, figures on that, Gayatri, you can let me have? I'm quite... Oh, here it is. Poll closed. Yes, 15% of you want conscription. I hope you've got your tin hat. Probably a tin foil hat, but a tin hat. Why don't you go to the front, you 15% fools? But 85% say no thanks. Nine danke. Nine danke. No gracias. No. 
Yeah, 85%. 517 people voted. So a big poll, but not a massive one, but still quite interesting. Illyrius of Illyria, what a wonderful name, says, will the Croatian president try to block Finland and Sweden to NATO? He said he would. I hope he will. Any others? Got about uh, 14 minutes left. Kesmi Kaloi, I wonder when you're going to talk about the upcoming war of Turkey versus Greece over the 12 islands. Well, I don't know uh, enough about that to talk about it. It's obviously a matter of concern if that is a possibility. Uh, I find it very unlikely that two NATO countries will go to war with each other. But hey, what can you rule out nowadays? Why don't you call the mother of all talk shows on Sunday and enlighten the audience about it? I must tell you, I must make an admission to you. I don't know everything about everything. In fact, there are some things I know very little about. But what I know about, I really, really know about. Here's some, uh, some messages. Uh, Jacques de Guernsey on the issue of uh, conscription from my cold, dead hands. And Andy, uh, who, if I'm right, is a fan of ours in Uganda, in Africa. Please form a battalion of all the Fruit Loops who have a Ukrainian flag on their Twitter page and send them. They support the nonsense. They should be first in. Quite right. Led by all the MPs that are gung-ho. And uh, Mrs. Jones says, I agree, a lot of the youth are doing nothing these days. Get some discipline into them and get them working productively in getting killed in a war against Russia. Not sure, Mrs. Jones, if the point didn't go over your head. X-Ray says, I can't believe yes, got 15%. Uh, they'll be shouting for the return of the birch next. Ouch! Listen, X-Ray, there's only thee and me even know what the birch is. Uh, here is, <laughs> there's more, more, but I've, uh, I've lost them. Uh, Manchester Chronicle has Captain Mannering on the phone. The yes contingent have a leader. How brilliant is that? Anything uh, more on the screen I can deal with? Kaid Al-Jamal Al gives 99.99 US dollars. Thank you so much for that. That's a really handsome donation. I really, really appreciate it. If, uh, if you keep these coming in, uh, between now and October, we'll have a fighting fund to launch uh, the midweek moats that will keep us going for weeks and weeks without any need for a sponsor. But I'm hoping that we will eventually have a sponsor for the midweek moats, certainly by Christmas. But if we can get from October to Christmas on uh, viewer support, that will be really helpful. Uh, Anthony McKen gives 10 British pounds. Thank you very much, Anthony. Expect the elites to send out their guard dogs, the police, if the strikes continue to start aggression, start cracking skulls, and use the media to blame the strikers for being violent. Well, interestingly, Anthony, I, uh, I fought every day of the coal strike in 1984-85, and in the audience in Newcastle on Monday, two nights ago, there were at least three people uh, who were minors, ex-minors, and who, two of whom, had lived through uh, that strike and the fabrication uh, by the media of uh, the false narrative that the minors were the violent ones rather than the victims of the violence. Uh, and so on. It was very interesting to meet people again who'd actually suffered that. And yes, you're right. If they can, they will. It's harder now, though, with social media. If you see a stramash or a rami going on now, everyone's got their phone out filming it. It's no longer just the BBC that can fabricate footage. Everyone's got a camera. Everyone is a photographer. 
uh, Doom One gives five British pounds. Thank you very much indeed. By Boris Johnson's criteria, Bush and Blair are the greatest examples of toxic masculinity in the 21st century. Thank you for the autograph in the past. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, I'll tell you what Gayatri's theory was, that Boris Johnson couldn't have come up with that bilge himself. It must have come from feminists close to him, that this is all about masculinity. Any feminists close to him? I don't know. If you were a feminist, would you really be close to Boris Johnson? Really? Uh, Richard White gave uh, a sum there, but I missed it. Can that be put back up on the uh, screen? Richard White gave 99 pence. Many thanks, Richard. The widow's might is just as valuable to us. God bless you. And uh, Constance Ahrens again. So, Gigi, did Biden give Erdogan the green light to invade Syria again at the NATO Madrid summit? Maybe in exchange for Sweden and Finland's NATO membership. Maybe uh, Erdogan said that he'd got out of Finland and Sweden everything that he wanted, but neither Finland nor Sweden, and certainly not Turkey, have published what it was that he got. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's a crackdown on the PKK. Maybe. As you say, it's something else entirely. Uh, just Reason says, your opinion on Nigeria and the self-determination of the Yoruba and Biafra nations, please. Well, you're going to be disappointed. I don't believe in breaking up uh, countries. I don't think Africa needs more countries. It needs better governance in the countries that there are and unity uh, between African countries. So I'm in favor of a uh, United States of Africa, and there's no need to break up Nigeria. I understand the painful past. I understand the misgovernance of Nigeria and the bloodshed that's still going on there, but it will not be made better by campaigning for still less actually going to war for uh, secession in Nigeria. That ended very, very badly before in the 1960s. Uh, Alberto Macatea, what a wonderful name. You're right about the Spanish territory in Morocco being ridiculous. The Falklands and Gibraltar are also absurd. You made a good case about the Falklands on the Sunday politics 10 years ago. Was it really 10 years yeah, it would be, yeah. Me and Gayatri were in Trafalgar Square, I remember. Uh, may even be 11 years, you know. Uh, no, no, it would be 10, yeah. It wasn't the Sunday politics. It was Andrew Neil's uh, this week. But, uh, yeah, uh, the absurdity of us claiming sovereignty over some rocks in the South Atlantic is matched only by the absurd notion that a rock on the end of Spain is actually part of Britain. I mean, these kind of colonial fantasies belong in the past, in the history books. Uh, T. Mac gives three pounds. Thank you very much indeed. Super sticker indeed you are. Thanks, Mac. Big G. Haywood. Now, I love that name and I love that avatar. Uh, exactly that was Oded Yanon's plan, a plan for the 1980s. Break all Arab nations up into their own ethnic, cultural, and religious enclaves. No to breaking up countries. Right on, big G. Uh, I've got five minutes left. If there are any more questions, just reason. Says not secession, but self-determination. Determination because the Nigerian state has robbed the indigenous peoples of the country of their identities. I don't know who are the indigenous peoples of Nigeria. All I know is that breaking up Nigeria is not a good idea. It will make everyone weaker. 
It will increase enmity and hostility and lead to violence and perhaps even war. But of course, uh, the uh, support for indigenous language and culture and so on, I support in every country, even in my own country here in Scotland, where a tiny, tiny proportion of people, not even 2%, I think 1% of the people of Scotland speak Gaelic. But I am happy to pay tax to help protect, defend, and enhance the Gaelic language and culture. Uh, I, I believe in that. But uh, breaking up countries is for the birds. Partition for the birds, believe me. Uh, Stephen Mulholland gives £10. Thank you, Stephen. Please mention Alina Lip, who could go to prison for three years for being a journalist reporting about Ukraine bombing the Donbass. Her father's bank account was closed by the German authorities. Yeah, I, I saw a reference, uh, Stephen, to that, but I don't know uh, much about it. Maybe you or Alina uh, could uh, call the mother of all talk shows on Sunday with a much bigger audience than this, uh, and we could, uh, we could get the details uh, of that and how we can help her if indeed she is. But Germany is going crazy, don't you think? Little Schultz has just proposed that Germany will annually spend 60 billion, 60 billion euros a year, Germany alone, on defense. Germany building a big armed forces. What could possibly go wrong, folks? You feel me? Last couple, uh, John, Johnny Blue Eyes says, talking about the massacre in Morocco, did you hear about the grotesque ceremony in Belgium to celebrate giving back the gold tooth, not teeth, tooth of Patrice Lumumba to his family, the man they murdered in 1961. One gold tooth was all that remained of the greatest of all African leaders, Patrice Lumumba, who was murdered by the Belgians, the British, and the Americans in concert in 1961, precisely because he was the greatest of all African leaders. They didn't just murder him. They dissolved his body in acid. And they've held on to that single gold tooth in Belgium until the last couple of months, weeks even. How sick is colonialism? but it's still, as we saw in Morocco, alive and kicking. A last one, uh, I think probably because it's uh, 11.29, I've got to let you get to your beds, at least you, the Brits. Uh, nothing more coming up And in that case. Hope you've enjoyed uh, the last uh, hour and a half. Thank you very much uh, for uh, joining me. Uh, I'll, I'll do five minutes uh, on my Patreon page, uh, but uh, the hour is late. So uh, if you are on Patreon, then uh, follow me over there now. If not, it's patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. And I'll be back on screen on the mother of all talk shows on Sunday at 7 p.m. God willing.